How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law, Thomas McCoy, and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. What's up, Doc? Hey, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. It's great, because I could hear you. That was a fantastic introduction, Mark Stiles yeah. of Stiles Law. Oh, thank you, Dr. Joe. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have a remarkable guest who is going to be talking about his new book that has just come out, about the Boston Gentleman's Mob, about a remarkable event in history. Josh S. Cutler is an attorney and state legislator representing the 6th Plymouth District of Massachusetts. He currently serves as House Chair of the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development. A former newspaper editor, Cutler is a graduate of Skidmore College, Suffolk Law School, and the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, Massachusetts Environmental Policy. He is also the author of Mob Town Massacre, Alexander Hansen and the Baltimore Newspaper War of 1812, History Press 2019, when he's not hot on the trail of 19th century abolitionist firebrands or Federalist agitators, Cutler enjoys photography, traveling, hiking, and spending time with his children. Representative Cutler, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Good evening. Great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Joe. I haven't I haven't seen you with the beard lately, so that that's uh, uh, looking good. I know. What do you think? <laughs> this is the COVID look. My COVID, COVID look. look. Yes. I, I, I haven't since had a haircut. I haven't had a haircut since COVID. So for those of you who... Oh, my. Okay. Yes. I, this doesn't show on radio, but uh, that's a... Doesn't show. Doesn't show. So um, Mark Stahl is, is, is going to be coming on, but so I, I just wanted to talk to you. First of all, thank you so much for coming on. And what a fascinating book. How, how did you decide to write this book? Want to just tell our listeners a little bit about it? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for, thanks for having me on. And thanks to listeners out there for, for tuning in. Uh, and it's funny, you mentioned February 19th. Um, my first book actually came out February 19th of 2019. So it is a good I, day to be uh, doing books. And yeah. uh, so I wish you continued success with that. That's a, a great news. Uh, but yeah, the first book I did came out a couple of years ago. And uh, it sort of led me to this project. I'm someone who, uh, you know, history is not my profession, but it's a, it's a hobby of mine. And I enjoy kind of learning and diving into moments in time in, in history that have had, you know, kind of a, a momentous impact that ripple throughout history and uh, kind of learning more about them. And, and that was what drew me to the first project I did a couple of years ago uh, about a gentleman named Alexander Hansen, who is the, the namesake for the town of Hansen here on the South Shore. We may have some listeners huh. from Hansen. And um, he was a, a newspaper publisher circa uh, 1812, who was very uh, passionate against the War of 1812. And he... Um, Upset some folks in the city of Baltimore, and they came and, uh, and tried to burn down his, his printing press and his office, and he, he fought back. Uh, and uh, one thing led to another, and it had you know a, a pretty a significant uh, impact on the, the course of the war and the Federalist Party, and and and, and certainly Alexander Hansen himself, uh, and later became uh, the namesake, as I said, for for this the town of Hansen here. So uh, that led me to the the new project, which uh, just come out, uh, the Boston Gentleman's Mob, Maria Chapman, and the abolition. Abolition Riot of 1835. It's a, it's a lengthy title, but there's a lot going on. And um, essentially, Joe, this is a, a story about a moment in time in 1835 right here in Boston. Uh, and it kind of took place in our backyard. And it was uh, what, what, what's been become known as the Gentleman's Riot, the Gentleman's Mob. Uh, and it was essentially um, a, a reaction to a growing abolitionist movement here in, in Boston and throughout uh, the Northeast uh, to, uh, in opposition to slavery. And, you know, we have this sort of assumption that Boston was always this bastion of, of abolitionist uh, uh, support, and that wasn't always the case. And, uh, mm -hmm. and at the time in Boston, the sort of establishment was very, uh, very much uh, anti-abolitionist. They, they felt the abolitionists were, were um, you know, uh, endangering the union and, and could cause uh, them 
heartaches with their southern trade partners, and so they they uh, they weren't in favor of these these abolitionists, and uh, and there was a riot that took place in the streets of Boston involving William Lloyd Garrison, who many many folks um, may be familiar with, and um, and so uh, you know one thing led to another, and this uh, gentleman's mob had a had a significant impact on the city of Boston and, the, and really the the. The whole trajectory of the abolitionist movement in, in in the Massachusetts and really across the country. So, it was a moment in time that I thought was kind of a really neat story to tell, and uh, really I've enjoyed kind of diving into this topic and telling the story, and, and hopefully now sharing it with uh, uh, listeners and, and, and readers. I mean, it's it's the the detail that you have in this book is remarkable. Um, how on earth did you did you research this? Well, you know, it's uh, the nice thing. Is, so my, I always I joke, my, my knowledge is deep, but not wide. Uh, so if you ask me, I can tell you the weather on, on August 21st of 1835. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I couldn't probably tell you what happened, you know, five years later. Um, but, you know, it, we're really fortunate. There's so many resources out there. You know, the Boston Public Library is, is a fantastic resource. They have a treasure trove of original letters. And back then, you know, people wrote letters all the time. We don't really sort of a lost art these days. Uh, but people wrote letters all the time, and that you know really helps to illuminate and and, and reveal uh, you know what happened in, in, in through history. And you know there are a lot of diaries, uh, obviously newspaper accounts where you know we, we say that uh, newspaper is sort of the rough first rough, rough first rough draft of history, and that is certainly the case. And so those uh, are, you know those original sources really you know if you look in the right places can really be helpful to 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 tell a story with you know the level of detail to really make it come alive, which is what I, I, I try to do in my work. Which I have to say, when I was going to school, learning about American history, I never heard about this story. <laughs> How yeah, come? That's a really good, really good point, Mark. We didn't hear about the story, Josh. They buried so, it. They buried it. What do you, yeah. What's going on? Yeah, no, well, that's, that's, uh, well, it, Helps me sell more books, I guess. But no, it's um, <laughs> it is it is uh, you know these are the kinds of stories I think we should be telling in history. You know, I, my son's uh, taking history these days in high school, and you know he kind of complains to me occasionally about it. But I, I tell him you know how exciting it can be when you really you know learn about uh, history and you know what happened in our past. And this is one incident, you know, a window in time, just a few days, and, and you know there was you know Hollywood level drama going on right in the streets of Boston, and you know it's pretty exciting to kind of to learn about it. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, I agree. <laughs> so, so you want to just like just tell tell us a little bit about the story uh, without giving too much yeah. away, but let's hear the sure. story. What happened? Yeah. So again, you know, it, it, so it, you got to go back to the fall of 1835, and really, this was the dawn of the abolitionist movement uh, against slavery in in, in uh, this region. Um, and really, you know, the, William Lloyd Garrison, who's probably a figure that may, most people at least heard of or are familiar with, was a, a radical newspaper publisher. He, he launched The Liberator, which was an abolitionist newspaper here in Boston uh, in 1831. And that was sort of the, the preeminent voice of the abolitionist movement. Um, but early on, you know, he was not well liked or well accepted, uh, you know, certainly in Boston, certainly not in Boston. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, as I said, the, the establishment of Boston at the time was was openly hostile to him and and, and uh you know felt like he was uh you know a jeopardizing the the state of the union also you know they here in boston even though we'd, we'd abolished slavery many years prior we still relied either directly or indirectly on the slave trade in some ways um textile merchants you know relied on you know cotton cultivated in the south and, and many, many other connections so you know it was really um it was not a welcoming place for abolitionists at, at that time frame. Obviously, you know, things changed over time. Um, and so Garrison had his newspaper and um, there, there was a, a, a growing movement of, of women who were getting involved in, in, in joining Garrison's movement. And in, in Massachusetts and Boston, there was a, an organization called the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. And a, a, a young woman named Maria, Maria Chapman, who is from Weymouth, so another South Shore connection, which is great. Uh, she was um, a young woman who um, was a, came from a sort of you know modest family, uh, but had uh, married to a prosper, prosperous ship chandler and lived in Boston. And she um, had you know she was an abolitionist, uh, but she was kind of getting more involved in the cause. And she got, met Garrison and got very much involved in this women's uh, anti-slavery society meeting. 
And so the women decided to um, host an annual, host their big meeting in, in Boston in the fall of 1835. Uh, they had to reschedule a couple of times because some of the, the, the people who, uh, the landlords didn't want the women to meet in their building because they were worried about the bad publicity they might get. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of anticipation and uh, angst uh, going into uh, the meeting uh, when it was scheduled. And, Hold on, let me just stop here for a second. So, yeah. so why were they worried about the bad publicity? What, what, what bad? Because publicity? nobody wanted. Because the abolitionists were really, were really just you know not well liked in the city, uh, and so you know there was a. Um, they were too progressive, Doctor Joe. They were. They were way too, progressive. too progressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those crazy the, women. Uh, How dare okay. they say these things? And yeah, so in fact, they were, you know, Congress Hall, which is was was a was a. Um, a, uh, a building uh, that was held for public events, you know, frequently. The, the ladies originally were going to host their, their 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 meeting there, but the proprietor of Congress Hall refused to allow them to come. And in fact, he puts a notice in the paper saying he would not allow them to use the building. He, wow. he felt so strongly about it. So I think it was it, they were they were viewed as radical uh, rabble rousers, you know, you name it. Um, so they they uh, they really had to kind of search around to find a location to host this meeting. And they, they did. They, they had a meeting in the, what was called the anti-slavery office, which was on Washington Street, right, right uh, around the corner from where the old state house is in Boston. So people know the old state house in Boston, right, right there. They held their meeting, and they invited uh, a, a gentleman named George Thompson, who was a, a British uh, uh, abolitionist uh, and was equally as detested as William Lloyd Garrison. Um, and so the day before, and this is, uh, uh, I mean, like funny now, but not funny then. Uh, a local newspaper that was very much opposed to the abolitionists decided to stir up the pot. And so they offered a $100 bounty for uh, anyone who would uh, bring in uh, George Thompson, this, this abolitionist. And so that really stirred up the populace and got people wow. really agitated. And they passed the handbills around throughout the city, down in the North End and throughout the merchant area of the city, and really kind of got people whipped up into a frenzy about this, you know, these raging abolitionists. And uh, it worked. The tactic worked. So when the, the day came, uh, October 21st, 1835, and the women held their meeting, uh, a, very quickly a group of men congregated outside, and it got very rowdy very quickly, uh, and they sort of overtook the meeting. What's interesting about the, 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 the men that were gathering in is that we think of, you know, mobs and riots being, uh, you know, uh, not, we don't think of them being the bankers and the merchants of society, the, the upper class, as it were. Um, and, but, but they were. On this day, that they, they were. It was really the, quote-unquote, gentlemen of Boston who were the ones that were most upset and uh, were out in the streets you know, objecting to this. And so they interrupted the women's meeting, and they uh, tried to seize William Lloyd Garrison. He made his way out a back door and escaped, jumped down two flights, and almost uh, fell in the process. He tried to run away to a local carpenter's shop and hide under a pile of wood chips. Uh, but the mob caught up with him, and they grabbed him, and they, they seized him by a rope and started to drag him down the streets of Boston. Uh, he was At one point, he was uh, helped by a, um, a union truckman who took pity on Garrison and intervened. But uh, a group of men wanted to bring him to uh, the frog pond on Boston Common and basically tar and feather him. Um, oh. And really, at the time, the only one who was standing up for Garrison and for the abolitionists was this group of women, uh, the Boston Female Abolitionist Society, Anti-Slavery Society, excuse me, and Maria Chapman, who was really the growing leader of this organization. And there's a famous uh, encounter that uh, she had with the mayor uh, of the um, city, uh, Mayor Lyman at the time. And um, it really, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll just take a moment and, and uh, read you the line because I think it's kind of- Please compelling. do. Please do. Um, so she she's there. Uh, the mayor is, is, is has come into the meeting. There's men surrounding, throwing orange peels and, and throwing pieces of wood and really uh, trying to do their best to interrupt this meeting. And Maria Chapman is trying to lead, you know, her, her fellow members to continue on to labor, you know, to labor through this. And so the mayor says uh, and she, so the, Maria Chapman believes that the mayor is really um, a puppet of the mob and is not really doing his job in, in, in keeping the peace. And so the mayor says, uh, Maria Chapman says, Mr. Lyman, your personal friends are the instigator of this mob. Have you ever used your personal influence with them? And the mayor responds, I know no personal friends. I am merely an official. Indeed, ladies, you must retire. It is dangerous to remain. 
And Maria's response, which has gone down in the history books, some people may be familiar with these words, she says, quote, if this is the last bulwark of freedom, we may as well die here as anywhere. And those words became a rallying cry for the abolitionist movement uh, for, for, you know, for years then. If you can Google them and you can, you can see uh, her name attributed to that. So she really took a stand against the gentlemen, as it were, uh, of Boston at the time and stood up for the abolitionists in, in a very courageous way. And I think that's what uh, kind of drew me to this story. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think she's a, a figure that is not super well known in history, but certainly deserving to be better known because I think she really uh, – took a courageous stand at that time and also had a really remarkable career thereafter. So that was, without giving away all the, the good stuff in the book, that oh, was sure. uh, essentially um, what happened on that day. And uh, I would just add one other uh, note, which I think is interesting, um, thinking about your work and the power of respect and how little moments can have a big impact, uh, as I was you know, reading about that. Um, one of the men who happened to be in the crowd that day was a gentleman named Wendell Phillips. And he was a young attorney uh, who had a law office on uh, right on Court Street there. Uh, he worked with other young attorneys, uh, some one of them whose name was Charles Sumner, who may be familiar to, to some folks. Wow. And he heard all the noise and the combustion and so forth and, and, and wondered what was going on. So we walked out of his office and saw the men on the street, you know, uh, rioting. And he, he asked uh, one of his colleagues what was going on. He kind of learned about, you know, what had happened with the abolitionists and why the the men were out there and he had really he was really apathetic to be at the time he really didn't he wasn't an abolitionist he wasn't really interested in, abol in anti-slavery issues he really was apathetic uh but it had a the day's events had a big impact on him and he later converted and became an abolitionist and in fact he became probably the leading abolitionist or one of the leading abolitionists of the of the 19th century um these today you know maybe your if your listeners may be familiar with wendell phillips he was really one of the preeminent social reformers of his of, of that century. There's a statue of him in the Boston Public Garden. Uh, and he was, you know, along with Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, really one of the titans of, of the movement. And really at all, the genesis of all of that was this mob, uh, eight, Octo October 21st, 1835, which really flicked a switch in his, in his brain, in his mind, mm -hmm. and opened up his eyes to what was happening. And it, it led to his career uh, his really, you know, sort of very significant, amazing career uh, for, for the next 60 years. So kind of getting back to what I know you're talking about with, um, with you know, how a moment in time can have a, a you know, impact that lasts, you know, throughout the history pages. Right. There's small changes can have big effects and you control no one, you influence everyone. And yet I, these were some of the businessmen of the community some of the people who were there, merchants and salespeople, why were they so against this? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, now it's easy to look back, and, 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 but I think at the time, you know, uh, the, the, uh, we think of Boston as this bastion of, you know, progressivity, progressiveness, progressivity, whatever the right term is there. Uh, but, you know, it was, it, it was people were, it was fear of the status quo, I think, you know, or, or wanting to protect the status quo. What you know, what they had at the time, and, and I think that was what was driving a lot of the fear. And um, you know, listen, there was you know, we had a civil war over this issue. You know, there was there was right to be concerned that uh, that there would be they would cause uh, friction with uh, the southern states, uh, and you know, certainly um, that did happen, and, and probably not soon enough. But um, you know, I, I think it was it was just a fear of that, and, and, and uh, you know, the the, the the status quo. So it was uh, it's interesting because I think. The two things that we think about, you know, with, with um, sort of looking back is, number one, that mobs are tend to be the ruffians of the world and that um, right. and Boston was always an abolitionist hotbed. And so really, back in 1835, neither one of these was the case. It's, it's a great reveal in, in so many ways. And, and it's sort of startling to think that we're not always who we thought we were. And what was the, what did he say, Dr. Joe? Politics and journalism. 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 Journalism and politics. So he's got two books out now. Is that right, Josh? Two books? That's right. Yes. Yes. With, with his most current book on a, on a really interesting topic about an event that happened right here in our backyard, downtown Boston, yeah. that I was unaware of until uh, learning about this story with our guest here. And, and yet it, it parallels so much of the social divide that we still encounter 
there was a line in the book that that um, that was interesting. Somebody there said there's a difference between anti-abolition and pro-slavery. I think that was Fletcher. Um, yes. Tell me about that. What is that? So, I mean, how is it? How is it different? Right. Well, I, th- I think at the time they were trying to sort of parse the the, the issue. Um, and, you know, that's, again, many, many of the establishment folks in Boston at the time, back in 1835, that's what they would say. Hey, listen, we, we think slavery is terrible. We're not pro-slavery. We're just anti-abolition. <laughs> and so that's the this distinction they tried to draw. And obviously, the, you know, the abolitionists rejected that uh, outright and, and felt that they were one and the same. Um, but, you know, that was, that was, a, that was a, a, a point of contention, for sure. Right. And then another person says, this isn't reform, it's revolution was another line that, yep. that caught my eye. And, and, and some of the men who, who you know, were, 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 were saying these things are men that, you know, we, that, that have, you know, Harrison Gray Otis, who's one of the leading, you know, figures in, in American history in, in Massachusetts. And, you know, and unfortunately, um, they, they didn't always meet the high expectations that we, we held of, that we held of them. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a bit about this. Um, what is the psychology think behind this resistance to the to abolition to saying you know slavery is not a good thing let's let's move away from that let's change our world it wasn't you know for for another 30 years that the 13th amendment finally comes into law so and 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 i i will say that i think given what we're seeing there still is this enormous social divide, that somehow we think that one group of people is going to take something from another group of people. So I have some ideas about that, but I'm just wondering, Josh, what what do you think? As as an author, as a journalist, as a politician? A couple couple things I'd say. I I, I always try to take an optimistic take on things. I think one of the, the nice things about this story is that, you know, number one, you saw saw this group of small group of women that really took a stand and, and, and changed, you know, a, you can see the ripple, you know, effect of, of what they did, how it would ripple throughout history and change the life of Wendell Phillips. It changed the life of Maria Chapman. It changed the trajectory of the abolitionist movement in, 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 in our region and, and across the country. Um, it, it actually w- woke up folks who maybe were apathetic at the time. Uh, and there's, you know, even someone like Charles Sumner, who we think of as this, you know, Titan of, you know, this uh, um, great statesman, um, you know, was really at the time he was he didn't really have much of a, you know, interest in these issues. He was a lawyer studying his law books and, and really interested in the, the legal side of things. And, you know, it wake, it woke him up and, you know, wanted him to, to make a difference. Um, you know, many of the women, um, there's a woman named Susan Paul, who I talk about in the book, who was uh, one of the few African-American women who was allowed to be part of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society at the time, and she was a remarkable woman who, um, whose father had had started one of the first black churches in, in Massachusetts and in, in Boston. So really, you know, it, it's a lot of incredible stories of of human, you know, humans overcoming, you know, this thing, which is why, I, you know, I think we have to focus on the on the good, on the good, or it can very be very easy to. And, and, and I and I I totally agree with that. And that's what I mean. The I am is is not judgmental. The I am is saying. So this is the best we could do. The question is why, who we are, why we do what we do. Just to get back to uh, that African-American woman, again, in your book, um, she wasn't an, uh, an original member of that group. Right? Weren't the women called out on it? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's act, totally accurate. That's a good point. Um, the, the, so this, this Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society, uh, initially, it was only white women. And uh, it was actually William Lloyd Garrison and others that kind of called them out on that. And they quickly realized, you know, that I think the error of their ways. And they uh, they admitted Susan Paul, who was a very res- respected uh, woman uh, who had already been very active in, in, in a number of areas. So they invited her in as the first uh, African-American woman and others, some others did join as well. So, um, you know, change comes about in different ways, but uh um, absolutely. And, and Susan Paul really was a, had a remarkable career. She's someone who I think we, you know, certainly I wish there was more uh, of historical sources to, to document what she did, because sadly, we've lost a lot of that to history. But we were able to kind of find piece together 
uh, you know, some important parts of her career and show um, some of the impact that she had. She, she for instance, uh, led a juvenile choir. She, she, she organized uh, her students. She was a teacher and a seamstress. She organized her students to sing songs, uh, anti-slavery songs, and she used that as a way to teach them uh, both reading and writing, you know, to learn the song lyrics, but also, you know, bigger issues like, you know, slavery and, and, um, and all the impacts that that, that, that had uh, segregation. Obviously, she, she's still, you know, she's taught in a segregated school. Um, so she was a really remarkable person as well as, as Maria Chapman and, and, and a number of the other women that were involved. And uh, so, you know, I think those are those are all, you know, neat stories that I think really um, are important to tell. And that's why I was glad to, you know, in a small way to try to tell some of those stories. Especially the, the women, once again, women leading the charge <laughs> in terms of of social change and social justice. And I, I think, you know, Joe, it, 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 I, you know, again, it feeds into what you've been talking about. Um, the power of respect, I think, you know, is, is um, you, you can see it. I think, you know, even back then, the women wanted to be respected and, and they weren't being respected. And the men were disrespecting them. And that was what led to, you know, sort of the, the confrontation. Uh, the same could be said of the, the abolitionists. And, and so, you know, that if we just listen to people and respect them, I think, you know, I'm not saying that wouldn't have happened, but, you know, um, things would be a lot a lot different and i think uh, that wasn't happening at the time yeah i agree and, and we have this this brain that is unfortunately designed to compare sets of information this is this is really the way our brain works if you think about in in infancy there's something called stranger anxiety happens around 7 to 8 months in a, in a little baby that stranger anxiety cannot happen until the child has enough data to compare sets of information. This is a familiar face, and this is not. And that, that idea of comparing sets of information perpetuates throughout our life. And sometimes we see somebody else that doesn't look like us, and it almost activates that same primitive stranger anxiety. Can I trust this person? Am I safe around this person? And of course, it's still an I am. It's the best they can do. But let's step back and look. Respect leads to value and value leads to trust. We should not be surprised. And when people don't feel respected, they don't feel valued and they will not trust you. Not a surprise. No, no, and, not surprised. and yet we see it over and over, but we can step back. You know, one of the things, you know, if part of the resistance to this change was financial, it also illustrates one of the great things that has happened over and over again. And I use great in quotes, not like it is a great thing, but it's been so powerful. We have increased our own value at the expense of somebody else. Over and over and over we do that. I can only be more valuable if I make you less valuable. But that's not true. That's not the case. Every time you remind someone of their value, you increase your own value. That's what the I am is trying to say. And that's why this book, I think, is so important because it shows that we have a long way to go, even though we've come a long way. So, why now, Josh? Why this book now in the midst of everything that's happening in our country? Not to put you on the spot, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I guess it, uh, it's either good timing or bad timing, I guess, depending on your, your point of view. Uh, uh, well, you know, I, I, had, I had finished the first book and I really enjoyed that, that process and uh, had sort of, you know, thought about a, a, a something, a, a next project and... Uh, and you know, wanted to do something a little bit more Boston centric. That happened. That book happened to be a lot. A lot of uh, action took place in Baltimore, and um, but you know, kind of led me to that. And then uh, the, I want to say the pandemic actually played a role because I, you know, was home more doing zooms and things like this rather than mm -hmm. being out at events every night. And uh, so I had more time to to do writing and research. And so that that I guess this was, this was my pandemic project. Other people built porches and did things. This was my pandemic project. It's great. It's great. <laughs> Did you yeah, find a lot of the information online? Yeah, you know, surprisingly, um, you, you can. And that was a challenge because a lot of things um, over the past year and a half, you know, are not fully open or can be challenging to, to get into. 
Um, but again, I'll, I'll say like, you know, the Boston Public Library has a digital commonwealth that they, a partnership that they do. And um, there are thousands of letters from the abolitionist era that are posted online. And, you know, you, you take some time. It's going to read you know, each one of them. You know, I thought my handwriting was bad, right. but uh, <laughs> their handwriting isn't always great. And I uh, can take some time to really read the letters and get context. But, you know, that really can reveal, you know, because people are writing on a daily basis. So you really can get a level of detail there. Um, which is amazing. And they're all, you know, almost all of them are online. Some of them I had, to, you know, a few letters here and there I had to really chase down, or I remember I had to call a friend of a friend to, to try to find a letter, a particular library that I couldn't get access to, things like that. But uh, I was able to do a lot of the, the research online. And we have some great libraries here on the South Shore. The Tufts Library in Weymouth um, had some great material on Maria Chapman. The Dyer Library in Abington had some original copies of the Liberator newspaper. Uh, Duxbury Rowland Historical Society had some material that was helpful to me. So um it's there's a lot of, we're really fortunate in that regard to have such a robust um you know folk group of uh his, historians and and historical resources at our uh, sort of our disposal here do you do you see this as uh, as a book that might be a supplement to an american history class somewhere yeah i think that i think you know like a 19th century american history course i think it's a nice way to kind of take one era and kind of dive into it a little bit more and you know it is you know the there, there was excitement, you know, there was a car chase, not a car chase, there was a horse carriage chase, um, you know, there was, you know, a near death experience, there was uh, confrontations and stuff. So there was some drama. Uh, so, you know, that kind of history, I think, does have some appeal to, to people uh, who maybe aren't just sort of just into history the way, you know, some folks are, uh, I think, you know, it has some popular appeal, at least, I hope it does. And I try to write my books in a way that's not, you know, dry. <laughs> Hopefully, readers can judge whether I succeed or not, but I try to make it uh, readable and enjoyable because you know I think that's that's important. How would it play? Oh, on it the, is. How would it play it on is. the screen? I I think that's a great idea. Uh, yeah. It would make a great screenplay. It really would. There's so much to it. You yeah. Know, no. I'll, well, you know, yeah. Doctor Joe, you, you you could uh, you could play one of the characters. I think you know. I, 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 I see Wendell Phillips to. maybe. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was was almost bald, so maybe. Um, Maybe Mark, maybe that's more. I'll do, it, I'll do it. Sign me up. I'll get my SAG card. I'm in. That would be great. A mob of gentlemen. That's that's interesting because we. I mean, we hear the word mob. We've been hearing that word mob a lot over the last few years, uh, and we do associate it with this particular type. And yet, it's not. It's, and, and at least this was right out there. There's a lot of subtle aggressions as well uh, you know there's this there's this idea of critical race theory maybe i shouldn't say it but is this that or is this just saying look this is what history is man this is what happened yeah i think this is just what happened and you know it's uh there's there's good and bad and you know there's people who rose to the occasion and others that maybe didn't meet our expectations but you know i think it's there's a fascinating window on uh a period of time that had a you know, had an impact much, you know, far beyond the, the day itself. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we think of, of, of Lincoln and, you know, the, it's, it's funny. Yeah. It's, uh, so at the time, you know, it's funny because we, you know, obviously Abraham Lincoln, you know, was, you know, the great emancipator and so forth. But at the time, you know, uh, some of the abolitionists were very skeptical of Lincoln. Uh, and in fact, Wendell Phillips once called him the slave hound of, of Illinois. Um, wow. He, they were not. They they were suspicious of him and his motives, and thought that he was you know going to hold firm. Uh, and ultimately, they came around, um, but it took some time. Um, and Maria Chapman, you know, and, and William Lloyd Garrison were both very suspicious and skeptical of Lincoln in, in the early days of the Civil War. So, um, you know, they were <laughs> they were tough yeah. to tough to convince, but yeah. eventually they did. They did come to believe in he was doing the right thing. And, and, of course, it wasn't just that moment with Lincoln signing the 13th Amendment. I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds of years before and still hundreds of years afterwards. And it's it's interesting. Um, so William Lloyd Garrison, after the, you know, the, the, the 13th Amendment was signed into law, sent to the states, and, and after that, it had the Civil War, and he really kind of felt like he'd accomplished his life's goal of, of you know, abolishing slavery and he kind of, um, you know, he, he, he switched gears, basically, whereas Wendell Phillips really took a different tact and really he, he was just getting his second wind in that. And he really felt strongly that it wasn't just 
about abolishing slavery was making uh, it was pushing for equality, real equality between the races. And so um, Wendell Phillips went on for the next you know 20 plus years and really continued to be one of the major progressive voices you know in, in America at that time, whereas um, William Lloyd Garrison and to an extent Maria Chapman, who um, they both had health issues eventually as well, felt you know really felt vest, so vested in abolishing slavery that once it happened, they really they kind of you know they 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 changed uh, their outlook a little bit. Uh, but so it's just interesting to see the kind of different different takes that people have. And the other interesting thing I just want to mention while I know we're running out of time is uh, someone like Wendell Phillips, who again became this you know major figure of the 19th century, all dating back in, in, in a big way to, the, to this to this riot that he just happened to stumble out of his office and, and witness as, as a young man in Boston. Uh, but you know, if you think about, if you read some of his speeches, I read one of his speeches from. I think it was like 1875, you know, fairly late in his life. And he talked about uh, advocating for an eight hour workday. He talked about currency reform. He rallied against the influence of the influence of moneyed corporations. And he decried what he saw as growing income inequality in the nation. And it's just remarkable. You think about all those things. You could talk about all those things today. That speech could be given today. That's right. You know, it was a hundred, you know, 150, whatever the math is, 150 years ago. Um, and so that that those that's what really kind of um, when I think about those things, realize, you know what, <laughs> it's not that different. <laughs> well, that's why history right. is so important, right? That's why we have to teach history. Yes, I absolutely agree about that. Yeah, right. But, but we have to change as well. We well, have we don't, to. We don't want to. Re- we don't want to repeat what didn't work. But it hasn't changed. It, right. I mean, because it, we're not teaching it, history effectively. Or is it? Is it just so embedded in our culture that, that we fear the change? And that, that, again, is that stranger anxiety. You know, relax, everyone. It's, it's okay. It's an I am. Everyone's doing the best they can. Let's just understand what it is. There's no reason why you should fear that you're going to be devalued when you make things equal when you when you allow and, and say let's do this even the word allow you know makes it sound like somebody else has more power over somebody we're going to allow this to happen as opposed to helping the the evolution of our society that's why that's why you know i really wanted you on here josh because some things just haven't changed and how do we do that how do we do it so you know the i am we're saying we're always doing the best we can. We're influenced by four domains, our home domain, the social domain, the biological domain of our brain and body, and the I see. How do I see myself? How do I think other people see me? Because the domains interconnect, a small change can have a big effect. So given where we're at right now and, and the history that you are showing us, what small change can you recommend to our listeners? So maybe we can make a real change. Well, I, I'll, I'll turn it back. I think, you know, what you talked about, about respect, uh, I think, you know, uh, the political political discourse sometimes can get very coarse. And I think it's incumbent upon us. And, you know, I'll speak to myself. It's incumbent on people like me to, to, to uh, you know, find to, the, the, the way forward to respect everyone's views and to, to you know, to have make sure that civility is, is, is really the, the, the watchword of our political discourse. I mean, that's so important. We, we see that, you know, on both sides or you know, all trajectories i guess i don't want to say there's both sides but um and i think that's you know respecting everybody is is really important so i, I think you know you're what you're talking about here is you know has a lot of uh, currency and is you know is an important takeaway to, to think about and for all of us i hope so i hope people understand that just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you value them less you, you can disagree with someone and still respect them and value them that's how we have this discourse it has to be based on trust. So, you know, I, I have purposely not been referring to you as Representative Cutler, but you are. You are state representative and yes. and a wonderful one. And I, and I say that knowing a lot of your history, too. The I am has the second truth. Because the four domains interconnect and everyone's interested in what you think about them. And they think about you. You control no one, but you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. 
Josh Cutler, what kind of influence do you want to be? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I want to be a, hopefully be a positive influence. Uh, first and foremost, I think, um, you know, that is something we all, uh, aspire to. And I, I certainly uh, do. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that, um, that I'm someone who, who, who does try to respect everyone and, and can try to find common ground. That's something that I've always tried to do, uh, in my political career and also just, you know, in general. And I think, um, uh, certainly m- many, most of the folks that I work with, I think have a, a similar view. And I'll just say, I, I think in another moment of optimism, I think, um, because we do hear often, um, kind of the negative side of things. I think the vast majority of people that I've ever, that worked with in my career in public service, you know, are, are, in, are doing it for all the right reasons and believe in, in, in public service and civility and, and working together and finding common ground. And, um, you know, occasionally we don't read newspaper stories about those people because they're probably boring and they don't, you know, <laughs> they're not exciting, but that is, that is the vast majority of folks. And, uh, you know, here in the South shore, we have a, a great group of colleagues, Democrat and Republican that I work with. I just actually tonight came from an event from that one of my Republican colleagues had, um, someone that I work with a lot. And so, uh, and I, cause I respect that person. I, you know, I wanted to go and support them. So I think, um, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I take an optimistic take out of all this. I think, uh, you know, that uh, we're, we're, people are, are good and, and that, um, you know, we can overcome the, what divides us. Yeah, I agree. And uh, Mark, did you want to say something or add something to that? I, I just wanted to give him a, a round of applause. Yeah, yeah that was an yeah. amazing explanation. And I, I agree because, you know, we, we hear so much about this divide between Republicans and Democrats. I'm so I'm so relieved to hear what you're saying. Me too. That it doesn't need to be that way. That it's not that way in, in most state houses, certainly here in Massachusetts. But it doesn't catch the eyeballs of the news, right? Right. Yeah, it's not. It's not exciting. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there's that old thankfully, thankfully it's there. <laughs> thankfully, civility is still there. Right. Well, you know, with, with news, I mean, who, who we're like preaching to the choir with Josh Cutler as a journalist? But you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. And this doesn't always do that. I so, can't wait to dive into that we, book. Before we, how do we get the book, Josh? Uh, well, it's all, it's available online, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I, I have a, a number of uh, events that I'll be doing coming up soon. Um, but uh, probably the best thing is, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of local bookstores left around here. But uh, uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, um, and we will be doing some local some book talks in the, in the near future. Thanks so much. Thanks, Charlie. Right, everybody. Hey, have a Good great night. Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, Bye, everybody. <laughs>